Good morning, friends. It's Steve from Southern Illinois again, and it's amazing. Okay, last week we were the land of ice and snow. Um, I told you it would be gone. Well, it's gone, and not only that, the birds are singing around me. The neighbors are working on their lawns. Okay, it, it's like winter's over and spring has begun. I had to drive down to El Dorado this week. It's about an hour's drive on wonderful, beautiful country roads. Happy Sabbath to you, DA. And uh, as I was driving, there was a rain cloud passing east of the highway in that morning. And there were a couple of breaks in the clouds and these, these beautiful uh, sunbeams were radiating down through the clouds, down to the ground. Oh, it was gorgeous. Uh, and, uh, but of course, I'm driving, so I can only enjoy the beauty in, in, in brief glances as I snatch them, or, uh, taking my attention away from the road. And I'm glancing over at the sunbeams and enjoying the beauty when all of a sudden a V of geese flew into a sunbeam and were silhouetted there. And one glance, two glances I'm enjoying it and then boom they're gone were they ever there I mean it was it was just one of those those moments of just pure pure joy pure beauty pure happiness pure glory oh I, I treasure those okay it's 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 food for my soul and my soul craves beauty and joy hope because depression has dogged me all of my life. As a child, I remember wondering what was wrong with me because there were extended periods of time where I felt no happiness. I just kind of trudged through life and did what was expected of me. By the time I became an adolescent, I had a name for what I was experiencing, but that didn't make it go away. In medical school, I realized how much help counseling and medication could bring to depression. And uh, my, my fourth year of, of medical school, uh, I was back down in the pit again. And so this time, I reached out for help. And I went to the counselor, and as part of the assessment, she asked me, So Steve, what can't you do now that you could do before this episode started? And I kind of drew a blank, and, and, and then I realized, okay, I can't run up the 14 flights of stairs to the hospital ward I'm assigned to right now. I can only make it up six of them. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she laughed. She said, Steve, I couldn't run up one of those flights of stairs to save my life. And that was when I learned that if you can still function, you're not severely depressed. True or not, that's what I learned. When I was in my 30s, things got really bad. I was suicidal and I was uh, picking out how to end my life. Uh, it got my attention and once again I, I sought help and the counselor I went to listened to me and he said, Steve, I agree. You're depressed. You're severely depressed. But you don't need medication. You're kicking the emotional props out from under yourself, left and right. You're working 90 to 100 hours a week. You grab sleep, food, even bathroom breaks whenever it's convenient, when the demands of work are not there. You're not spending time with your family. You're not taking care of yourself mentally. You're not taking yourself, care of yourself spiritually. You cannot have emotional health when you're not caring for your body and your mind and your soul. And so rather than medications, he prescribed, get this, back to the basics, regular sleep, three squares a day, regular potty breaks at work. I mean. This is ridiculous. I, here I was, a grown adult, having, be, be, having to be taught how to live the basic principles of life. But you know what? 
within a couple of months, I was feeling so much better. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing, okay? And then when I experienced spiritual revival and Jesus became personal in my life, uh, those episodes of depression almost completely disappeared. It still dogs me. I still have to take care of myself. But now when I start to feel the clouds gathering and the pit threatening to suck me in, I know where to turn. I have to pay attention to the basics. Don't worry. I'm not going to commit suicide, but it begs the question, why didn't I? Why am I alive today? Why am I not a statistic in the morgue? Well, part of the answer is that when I was down in the pit of despair, I had a rope I was holding on to. <clears throat> Every morning when I woke up, in those brief moments between unconsciousness and total awareness, I had this sense of someone leaning over my bed, not in a threatening fashion, but leaning over my bed in compassion, concern, confidence, and joy that I was there. I called it my Abba experience. It was, it embodied to me what I thought of as the ideal father's attitude towards his child. And there were mornings when just that sense would bring tears to my eyes as I was there waking up and make me recognize how thankful I should be. When I described this to one of my counselors, okay, concern clouded his face, and he said, Steve, um, does anybody else see this apparition? Apparition? <laughs> and I kind of laughed and said, I don't see this apparition. There's nothing to see. It's, it's not a, a hallucination. It's, it's a sense. It's a feeling. A gestalt. But it reassured me that no matter how dark my emotional state was, that out there somewhere there was someone, something that cared for me, that loved me, that was confident that I was going to make it through this time period, and um, at the same time was concerned for me. They didn't, it wasn't belittling my, my, my pain, not denying it, not telling me to buck up and keep a stuff a lip, stiff upper lip. It was pure empathy. And that rope was what I held on to in my darkest moments when everything else seemed to be giving way. Now people search for truth in different ways. Uh, some people depend on facts to define truth for them. If a belief corresponds to a fact, it's true. If no fact supports a belief, then the belief is suspect. This is a very valuable tool for truth finding. I use it myself frequently. It's, it's the core of scientific method. But COVID has made us realize that it has an Achilles heel. What is fact? One man's fact is another man's fake news. Therefore, one man's truth is another man's delusional fantasy. Non-religious people tend to de depend on physical facts, aka science, or uh, popular facts, popular opinion. Okay? Uh, Christians, religious people, tend to be depend on religious facts. For Christians, that translates to the Bible. The facts that you choose have a strong influence over what you believe is truth and what is not. Now, other people would choose to find truth uh, through appealing to a cohesive body of beliefs. If a belief 
core, core uh, if a belief matches up with that body of beliefs, then it's probably true. If, it's, if it doesn't match, then they reject it outright. Once again, in the religious realm, this is very common. People uh, look to what their pastor says or uh, what their favorite theologian uh, teaches, this comprehensive body of beliefs, and if something doesn't disagree, doesn't agree with that, they reject it. If it, if if a belief agrees with it, then they incorporate it. But this isn't just religious people that do this. I mean, think of Facebook. It happens all the time. Disagree with me, unfriend, and we create these silos of only people who talk like us. It's the same thing. If you don't agree with me, you're out of here. And then there's experience, okay? If a belief correlates with my experience, then I'm satisfied believing it. Based on my experience. If it correlates with the experience of my friends and the people I identify with, then it's just common sense to believe that. But this puts truth into a very personal aspect. And taken to an extreme, uh, it becomes relativism. My truth is my truth because it's my experience. Your truth is your truth because it's your experience. My truth is okay. Your truth is okay. All truth is okay because all truth correlates with someone's experience. And it gets dizzy, okay? And we have a hard time having conversations because everybody's tiptoeing around, not wanting to infringe on somebody else's truth. Uh, religious people, Christians in particular, uh, tend to think that this is the devil talking. And I used to really react negatively to re relativism and basing truth on, on experience until I read the Bible for myself. Do you realize that in the Old Testament, the authority of the Old Testament rests on the experience of the plagues at Egypt, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, hearing the voice of God. Again and again through the Old Testament, experience is appealed to to validate belief. The prophets appeal to their own personal experience of visions as the basis for the authority of their communication. When you turn to the New Testament, again and again, you find the apostles saying, I was an eyewitness to this. We know this is true because we saw this, we heard this, we felt this. Experience is the foundation on which the Bible writers claimed the validity of what they were saying, of what they believed. My Abba experience has become for me just such a truth. It's a rope that pulled me out of darkness. A promise of light and hope that kept me alive. I didn't, don't need facts or philosophy to validate that truth for me anymore. I have experienced it. I was reminded of that this week when I was attending yet another funeral. I had quite a few of them in the recent past. This time it was the father of a friend who had died and her brother who is a pastor was sharing what his father had meant to, to him and he said something that really touched me. He said, my father chose me. Not many of us can say that, okay? My father chose me. His father had been a Vietnam vet. He had um, come back from the war, bruised and battered, and thrown himself into work. And he was in his mid-30s before he got to the point where he chose to marry. And But the woman that he loved came with baggage. And in the words of the speaker, 
she had three children who were a handful. My father chose me. His father chose to marry his mother despite the three children. No, not despite the three children. He couldn't wait to spend time with them. He couldn't wait to work with them, to play with them, to love them. My father chose me. That's the core of my Abba experience. My father chooses me. You know, we as Christians often miss that point. Emotionally, experientially. Jesus came to save the world. We have a mission to tell the world. And we miss the point that Jesus came for me. Jesus loves me. One of the authors of the Bible says, He chose me before I was even formed in the womb. Is that your experience? Now, you can dismiss my truth as a fantasy. You're basing your truth on the experience of what happens to you in that quasi-state when you're waking up? It kept me alive, friends. It corresponds to facts that I accept as true, but you may not agree with those facts. We each have to choose. It fits with a cohesive system of belief that I accept, but you may not accept that same body of beliefs. We each have to choose. It derives from my personal experience, not yours. You can choose whether to accept my experience because you identify with me or to reject it and say, if it doesn't happen to me, it didn't happen. You see, each of us has the power of choice, the freedom to choose. So often when we're seeking truth, we think of ourselves as being bound by the facts. If the facts say this, I have to believe this. Or we use the body of beliefs to, to create walls. This is in, that's out. And we miss the point that we have the freedom to choose. Now this sounds dangerous, okay? And it's radical. But when the Bible says, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. It's referring to that very fact. It didn't say, you're stupid if you don't believe. No, it said, choose, make a choice. You'll have to live with the consequences of that the choice. And really, none of us know for sure what the consequences will be. We know what we hope, we know what we believe, but we don't know for sure. But what I can tell you is that this personal experience, this rope of hope, this sense that there is more to life than the material, than the physical, that there is a being out there who loves and cares for me, kept me alive. At least consider the rope that I'm offering you. If you find yourself in a pit of despair, of darkness, guilt, Whatever it is that depression has sucked you down into or anxiety is turning around you like a storm, I'm throwing you a rope. My personal experience, true. But maybe it can be yours. Thanks for joining me today, friends. Have a wonderful week. I'm not going to talk to you about COVID and all of the difficulties that I'm facing because... Those geese flying into my life became a moment of hope I wanted to share with you. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you.